Lecture 17 Romulus, the founder of Rome We continue with our study of the foundation myths, the heroes, the early history of Rome. By the time Rome had become the superpower of its day, master of a world empire, stretching throughout the Mediterranean world, by, let us say, the mid-2nd century BC, Romans and Greeks alike had worked out a clear analysis of how this great city had come into being and why it was able to achieve so rapidly its conquest of a world empire. The uh, Greeks had been conquered by the Romans, but as the poet Horace said, having been conquered by the Romans, the Greeks then conquered the Romans. That is to say, Greek culture became the culture of Rome. And it was really from Greek historians that Romans began to learn to write history. And by the second century BC, there was an agreement that Aeneas had founded what would ultimately become the Roman nation. Romulus had then founded the actual city of Rome in 753 BC. And in 509 BC, the Romans had driven out the last of their kings, King Tarquin, and become a republic. And all three of these events in the early history of Rome became the subject of great books. The Aeneid is most certainly a great book with its theme of the wanderings of Aeneas and the idea that the gods had determined that Rome would rule the world and bring to it peace and prosperity. T.S. Eliot would say how the Aeneid speaks across the ages by, in the 20th century, declaring the Aeneid to be the perfect example of a classic. But also the story of Romulus and the story of the foundation of the Roman Republic attracted the attention of great writers. In particular, Livy, Plutarch, and Dionysius of Halicarnassus. All three of these writers were enormously influential with the founders of our country. If they were to put up a list of books they wanted their citizens to read, that they wanted taught in the schools, Livy, Plutarch would be at the very top, but also, surprisingly to us perhaps, Dionysius of Halicarnassus. Livy wrote in the last years of the first century BC. He had seen the civil wars that had almost destroyed Rome, and he had seen the rise to power of Caesar Augustus and the establishment of what was, in fact, a monarchy. Livy believed that liberty was the no most noble of ideals, but that the Romans of his age were no longer capable of self-government, and monarchy was the only solution. But he looked back to the early days of Rome and to the great deeds and the heroes that had first brought Rome into the world and then established Roman liberty. And the founders uh, loved Livy. He was a school textbook read over and over again in classes throughout the infant United States. And many of the founders had sharpened their Latin skills in high school by reading Livy. Men like James Madison, Thomas Jefferson admired him tremendously. Plutarch was perhaps even more admired. Plutarch wrote in the first part of the second century AD, so two centuries under the imperial rule of the Caesars, he wrote a set of lives of the noble Greeks and Romans in which he sought to pair a noble Roman with a noble Greek. For example, Theseus with Romulus. The lessons of liberty, the lessons of heroism were so profound in uh, Plutarch that uh, one of the founders, uh, Hugh Henry Brackenridge, suggested that a copy of the lives of the noble Greeks and Romans be placed in every schoolhouse in this country. And finally, there was Dionysius of Halicarnassus. He's not read much today, and 
I must say he's very heavy going. But the founders read him, particularly for his discussion of the Roman Constitution. And he was almost as influential as the Greek historian Polybius in the founders using the Roman Constitution as a model for our own. Plutarch and Livy and Dionysius of Halicarnassus all admit that the early history of Rome had become surrounded with fables, half-truths, and it was very difficult to actually discover what had happened, but they thought it worthy of doing so. Thus, they begin with Aeneas coming with his Trojans, landing in Italy, marrying the beautiful Lavinia, the daughter of King Latinus, and beginning the process by which Romans would, be, would grow out of the Latins, the Trojans, the Etruscans, and even the Aborigines and the Greeks who had settled there. But between Aeneas, who had to be dated sometime around the Trojan War, and indeed it was generally thought that Aeneas had arrived seven years after the end of the Trojan War, so at least as er, not much later than perhaps 1200 BC, how did you get from Aeneas, 1200 BC, down to the time of um, the founding of Rome in 753? Well, it seems that 13 kings ruled over the city that was founded by Aeneas' son. Now, that son was named Ascanius, but he also came to be known as Julius or Julius. He was indeed, as the ancestral tree was traced back, believed to be the ancestor of both Julius Caesar and of Augustus Caesar. So Julius had founded a city, Alba Longa. It means the long white city uh, because of the white walls that surrounded it. And it was not on the coast where Aeneas had landed, but far inland, about 15 miles eastward from Rome, up in the Alban Mountains. And there, for 13 generations of kings, Alba Longa had prospered. But power corrupts. And that's one of the crucial lessons that the Romans learned from the history of their being under the rule of kings. And Numitor usurped the throne of Alba Longa from his brother Amulius. And afraid that Amulius' daughter, Rhea, would bring forth a son to overthrow him, he turned her, the uncle did, turned his niece into a Vestal Virgin. There were always in the historic period six Vestal Virgins at Rome. They kept the sacred fire burning, going back to those ancient days when it was very hard to start a fire. And uh, a city, a little town, a village would keep its fire burning eternally so that everyone could take the fire from it. And the task of the Vestal Virgins was to tend this fire make sure it never went out, because if it went out, the city would die, and they had to remain chaste, probably if we look back into the anthropology of it, because it's believed that sex uses up energy, and that would take away the energy of the fire. But at any rate, there were the six, six Vestal Virgins, and Rhea, the daughter of the king who had been overthrown, uh, was one of them. But somehow, she became pregnant. Now we're beginning to discern some real themes that run all through our study of these heroes. One, the magical or miraculous conception. She's a virgin. She had slept with nobody, but suddenly she was pregnant. And she told that, in fact, it had been the god Mars who had come to her, and that is why she was pregnant. Well, her uncle, the king, was suspicious of this. On the other hand, he didn't want to do anything too dire to the, uh, possibly the sons of Mars, so he had a halfway uh, measure, very much like the, and we find in the story of Moses. He had the two little babies, because twins were born to her, uh, put in a basket. 
So once again, the theme of the miraculous child or children who is then put into a basket, pitch put around it, and set afloat. We find this theme going all the way back, you'll remember, to the 22nd, uh, 2200 BC in the great ruler of Akkad Sargon. We find it in uh, Exodus and we find it here in the foundation stories of Rome. So it floats down and it comes to rest under a fig tree. Ah, the waters of the Tiber River are swollen, but it has got pushed over through the flood tide into a more narrow channel where the water is not so swift and it washes up under a fig tree. And henceforth, every Roman city, the heyday of the empire, would have a fig tree in the forum, in the uh, municipal center of the town to commemorate this miraculous saving. And under that fig tree, the two little babies lay in their basket and they were crying, of course, they were hungry. And a she-wolf heard them and she came took them by the nape of the neck, one at a time, took them into her cave, and there she nursed them. And again, in the heyday of the empire, in the second century AD, whether you were in Rome itself, or far out in the province of Africa, in a city like Leptis Magna, that was a colony of Rome, you had in the middle of the municipal complex, this statue of the wolf, nursing the two little babies. So this was the foundation myth of Rome. Miraculously, these children were saved so that they could create the miracle that would be Rome. And after she had nursed them for a while, they were discovered by a shepherd and his wife and taken in and raised by them. But nothing could diminish the fact that these were special children big strapping boys, handsome. And the story began to spread that these must be those two little babies that had been shipped away by the evil king Amulius in Alba Longa. Thus, when they reached the age of 18, Romulus and Remus made their way back to the city of Alba Longa, overthrew their evil uncle, and restored their grandfather to his throne. But not only are they, do they represent the theme of the miraculous birth, the miraculous salvation of the hero as a baby, they also represent the hero who goes on a quest. And their quest was to establish a new city. They went back to where they had been raised and were determined to erect there upon the site of Rome, a new city. And they began to lay out the city on the Palatine Hill and on the Aventine Hill because these twins did not get along. They quarreled almost constantly. And Romulus said, we're going to erect a city on the Palatine Hill that has the best defenses. And Remus said, no, we're going to establish our city over on the Aventine Hill. That has better land for farming. Romulus said, look, who's running this show? And Remus said, I'm running it. I'm the stronger brother, maybe even the older brother. How do you know that? Well, I think there's only one way to decide this. And this is a good Roman way. We will ask the gods. We will take the auspices. That is, we will ask the gods whether Romulus or Remus should be king over this city and where it should be founded. And we will ask that the gods send a sign. Thus was held the first set of auspices at Rome. Later, the historical period, right on down until the end of the Roman Empire in the West, no action was taken without a consultation of the gods. There was a special set of priests, the augurs, who interpreted these signs. And thus, Romulus and Remus both ask, using the traditional curved shepherd staff of the augur, 
O Jupiter, Jupiter, show us who should be king over this new city. And Remus on the Aventine Hill saw almost immediately six vultures. But, Re, uh, but Romulus on the Palatine Hill saw, after Remus, 12 vultures. So again, they started fighting and arguing. Look, I saw them first. Yes, but I saw more. Well, Romulus was just going to go ahead on his own. And he plowed around the perimeter of the city he was going to build. Never thereafter, when a Roman colony was established, first in Italy and then in places like Spain and North Africa, Turkey, the magistrate would plow around the city where the walls were going to be. And when they came to the spot where gates were going to be, they raised up the plow and went on until the size of the gate was achieved and then down and continued their plowing. So Romulus plowed the first pomerium, the first circuit of Rome, and started building his walls. And Remus came up, having watched all of this labor, and said, those are the most pathetic, puny little walls I've ever seen, and jumped over them to show his contempt. Romulus struck him dead, grabbed a dagger, and killed his brother. And so the foundation of Rome began in fratricide. Later on, after all the blood of the civil wars had been shed, Livy looked back and wondered if that wasn't something like an original sin which the Romans had finally to expiate. And we find another theme with our heroes, like Jason, like Theseus. Not every deed they do is clean and fine. You cannot become a hero and never commit a wrong. Thus Remus is dead and Romulus is now free to continue building his city. And he named it after himself. Now we shall deal more with the very hypercritical scholars of the 19th and 20th, even of the 20th first century who want to take away all history from these stories. And these scholars will tell you that a Romulus never existed. Uh, and that, in fact, he was made up out of the name of the city of Rome. Now, that just somehow strikes me as very bizarre. I think it perfectly reasonable that Romulus would have named the city after himself rather than the other way around. You had a city named Roma, and somehow you had to come up with somebody who founded it. No, Romulus founded the city and named it after himself, as so many founders of cities did. After all, what was the name of Istanbul? But Constantinople, the city of Constantine. So he named his city, but he had to have some inhabitants. And he sent out a message all through Italy. I would like anybody who wants to make a fresh start in life to come here. Come to Rome, start all over again. And so a ragtag gang of people began to arrive, all of them men to settle the new city of Rome. Well, the founders of our country found some, something to interest them in that. After all, America has always taken the tired and the hungry and brought them in and given them a new start in life. That's what Romulus wanted to do. Well, there were all these men, but they needed women. Just so, uh, like on the American frontier. Uh, you might have a town with all these men and no brides. You had to send off, get mail order brides. Well, there was no way of going on the internet those days to mail order a bride. So Romulus came up with the idea of inviting his neighbors, the Sabines. The Sabines lived on the hills near Rome, but thought of themselves as distinct from the Latin Romans. And Romulus sent out a word to the villages of the Sabines, each of whom had its own little local king, and said, please come, help us celebrate the birth of our new city. We're going to have a huge festival, and we'd like you to share in this joy with us. And it was held down in what would later become the Forum. That's the low-lying, somewhat marshy land that lies under the Palatine Hill. Sabines came and they brought their wives and they brought their daughters. And after a good deal of wine had been drunk, suddenly the 
Romans each grabbed one of these Sabine girls and ran off with her. Took her back home. They had walls on their, and they're around their city now, and the Sabines could not get their daughters back. And the Romans took them by force. The rape of the Sabine women. Well, the uh, fathers and brothers weren't going to allow this to happen, of the Sabines, so they forced the Romans to fight a battle. And the two of them were coming to grips, and the Sabines began to besiege the city of Rome. And on watch was uh, a Roman, Tarpeius, and his daughter was with him there, Tarpeia. And she was uh, one of these Roman women, and uh, she talked to her father and said, Dad, you know, I can uh, really watch while you go off and maybe get a little bit of sleep. Well, what she was really interested in were the golden armbands that all the Sabines had. So she sent out a shouted down to them, come up close. I'll let you inside the city if you will give me what is on your left, left arm. Left arm. And what was on their left arm was not only these golden bracelets, but their shields. And to show their contempt for such a traitress, the Sabines loaded her up with shields until she was killed and then kicked her off the high point, which was ever after called the Tarpeian Rock. But the Sabines were unsuccessful in their attempt to capture the city. They and the Romans continued the war until the Sabine women themselves, who had been abducted by the Romans, came out and said, Fathers and brothers, please stop fighting our husbands. We want to be married to them, and we want Sabines and Romans to become one people. And so it was done. And Rome thus began its history as drawing to it all manner of people, the poor and the Sabines. Unlike Athens, which made it almost impossible for a foreigner to become a citizen, the Romans throughout their history welcomed immigrants, made them citizens. Romans, even when they let a slave free, when they manumitted a slave, he or she was given Roman citizenship. And that was part of the reason for the growth of Rome, was its ability to welcome immigrants from all over. So the Sabine women became the legitimate wives of the Romans, but uh, some legacy of this was left over. And it was said that whenever a Roman wedding occurred, the new husband picked his bride up and carried her over the threshold in commemoration of the fact that the earliest marriages at Rome had been this raping of the Sabine women, carrying them into the house against their will. So Rome now had women, children began to be born, and Romulus began to carry out a foreign policy to make Rome the most powerful town in the neighborhood. He waged war against the Latins. He waged war against one Sabine village that held out against him. Uh, and in that battle, Romulus killed the chief, the king of the Sabine, of the Sabine village, Akron. He killed him stripped his armor, having fought him in hand-to-hand -hand combat, cut down a huge oak tree, and carried it back to Rome. And so was born the Tropeum. When the Romans fought a great battle and won, they would erect a monument decorated with the arms taken from the enemy. And if a general killed the enemy general in hand-to-hand -hand combat, he received the spoilia opima, the richest of spoils. And that was an enormous trophy erected in the temple of Jupiter. And Romulus was the first to win the spoilia and the first to celebrate a triumph. That fundamental statement of Roman warlike character when a conquering general rides through the city 
the conquered enemy marching before him in chains, his soldiers carrying huge placards describing vividly the events of the war, men like Scipio Africanus and Augustus himself. Romulus was the first to celebrate a triumph. So Romulus is the establisher, just as Theseus was at Athens, of fundamental Roman institutions. The auspices, the triumph, and the senate. And Romulus picked a number of men he had valued for their advice, some say as many as 300, a number of men he valued for their advice and made them called the fathers. And they would guide and direct the policy of Rome all the way down again until the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in 476. The Senate would serve continuously under both the ancient kings, under the free republic, and then under the Caesars. And these first families who were chosen to be senators were called the patricians. All the rest of the ordinary people were the plebeians, but the senators were the foundation of the class of the patricians, which would still dominate and be present in Rome in the 4th and 3rd century BC, and at the time of Julius Caesar. He was deeply proud of the fact that he came from a patrician family. So the division between patricians and plebeians, that was part of the legacy of Romulus. But also, power corrupts. And the more he ruled, the more wars he fought, the more institutions he put into place, the more haughty Romulus was thought to become. And thus it was that one day, Romulus simply disappeared. And the people ask, what has become of King Romulus? What has become of our founder? Word began to be whispered and then more loudly and then riots broke out. What has happened to Romulus? It was asked to the Senate. And it was said by many that the Senate in its jealousy had torn Romulus to pieces and scattered the body. But one man whose word was taken by senators and ordinary people alike, by patricians and plebeians alike, said no. Romulus did not die. He was taken up into heaven. He came back to me and said, I am no longer of this earth, and you are now to worship, worship me, for as a god I will protect at the side of Jupiter the Roman people. And thus, to the end of the Roman paganism, sacrifices were offered up on an annual basis to Romulus as Quirinus. That, he said, is my new divine name, Quirinus. And the people of Rome, in every formal setting, were always called, not the Romans, but the Quirites, the people of Quirinus. Is there any truth to the story of Romulus? Well, there are many historians still today who would say what a mid-19th century historian would say. It's total legend. It's completely fabulous. Well, in fact, almost as soon as the forum began to be excavated carefully in the 1870s, on the Palatine Hill was found remains of the original huts of that city dating to the 8th century. And the Romans believed that the early hut of Romulus had been preserved. More strikingly, in recent years, led by the Italian archaeologist Andre Carandini, the wall that Romulus originally built, dated clearly to the 8th century, has been discovered. There has been discovered a cave which the Romans in the historical period believed was the cave where Romulus and Remus had been nursed. And most strikingly, in 2005, Andrea Caradini has discovered in the Forum a large 10-room house dating from the mid 
8th century, dating from, let us say, around 753 B.C., which he insists, and I agree with him, was the palace of Romulus, far bigger than any other structure inside that city. So Rome was inhabited in the 8th century. It had a palatial dwelling, and the burial uh, findings show that two distinct people, the Sabines and the Romans, came together to form one city. So yes, I believe in a historical Romulus.